So uh, this is the Easy Coach. Uh, this is one of our informal one-on-one -on -one coaching broadcasts. My guest is Shivang. Shivang is uh, looking to get advice on how to break into being a technical program manager coming from his current role in DevOps. He did a great job preparing me to help him. He gave me a copy of his resume. So he's got a bachelor's degree, I won't say from where, to preserve his anonymity, um, and a master's uh, in information systems and operations management. And he's got a good job uh, that he's had for several years as a DevOps engineer. It's in a cold place. <laughs> and he would like to go to a warm place. So before I jump in, uh, Shivang did a great job giving me some questions he'd like to cover in tonight's broadcast. You can't hear me. Okay. Uh, my moderator says she can't hear me. Can you hear me at all, moderator? Not on stream. I'm guessing you're muted, but let's check. Um, see, this is why we test. Because my volume shows like it's there. Uh, let's see. Yeah, it's just you. Okay, thank you, Gunyush. That's very helpful to know that you can hear me because for some reason the moderator can't. Luckily, you can moderate in silence if you have to. All right, so going back to the broadcast, um, uh, my first question for you actually is, uh, something we never talked about on purpose, I wanted to ask you on stream. Why do you, how did you come to the conclusion that you wanted to be a technical program manager? Like what has made that your career of choice for your next step? All right. So as we've already discussed that I come from, uh, from a couple of years of uh, technofunctional experience and uh, where I have performed uh, technical project management and to some degree, some level of program management since I was uh, looking at the delivery of very specific software solutions. And now coming into the current role, which seems a bit siloed for my interests, I realized I could very clearly make out the difference that I clearly enjoy dealing with uh, people directly instead of having a gatekeeper in between. So case in point being, the product manager acts as a, as a, a stage gate between the customers and myself. And any feedback that I have to provide to people or people have to provide me is via that person. And I think I now realize that I am the kind of person who enjoys driving projects myself instead of being told exactly what to do, do step A and then B and C and then get done with it. I like to own things end to end and uh, get feedback on that directly from people instead of having the third person involved. Okay. So it sounds like your main motivation is to get some role that gets you more controller influence and brings you a little bit closer uh, to the customer, whether that's an internal customer or external. Is that right? That's right. And uh, there's a bunch of roles that do that. Um, you could head towards management, perhaps. You could head towards a different type of engineering, like uh, sales engineering or uh, other, other roles, systems engineering. I'm not, uh, I think technical program manager, by the way, is a fantastic choice. I'm just trying to understand a little more did you consider other options or is TPM kind of been the obvious one? Uh, it actually started with business analyst. Okay. I didn't realize that business analyst would, would probably just apply to a specific project and not kind of align with the uh, company's goals, which is what a program manager does. And then I also looked at sales engineers, but then you have the sales related targets associated with it and which may, I, which may or may not bring down my productivity. So I just think that program management is kind of a logical extension to what I've done previously in a part-time capacity, even though I may not have held that uh, role title, but I just think it is kind of an extension to where I think I want to go instead of uh, aggressively meeting sales targets and uh, stuff like that. Okay, fantastic. So um, the first question you wrote me and uh, viewers may see me refer to the handy sheet uh, that, that Shivan gave me of all the things he'd like to do um, was, uh, I'll just read it as you wrote it. Uh, how, to, how can you successfully break into a, from a full on technical role, a full time technical role to technical program management? So how do you make that change? Um, 
And I thought that was a good point for us to start our discussion because uh, usually that change happens organically a little bit. And it may be tougher. I know you're in a DevOps role now. The way I've seen, um, and uh, one of the fans here in chat says that's an awesome answer for why to be a TPM, which I agree. So you're getting applause already from the audience. Um, so, uh, and by the way, I encourage uh, the audience, if they have things to add to the discussion, please jump in because I don't know as I always have all the answers and I'll relay any good advice to Shivang or he can watch the uh, broadcast later and see all the chat. Um, but I'll relay anything that comes up that I see. And meanwhile, uh, it is also a good point, time and place for me to remind viewers when I speak here, I'm representing myself, not Amazon or Twitch. And we welcome your comments. Uh, thank you for being here. So um, on this point of how to make the transition, the way I've seen that normally happen is someone will take on some project or program responsibilities in their current role and demonstrate that skill. And then they'll be moved internally. Um, if someone's going to move externally, like what you're, I know, considering, uh, where you're going to try and change jobs, there are two options. One is, of course, you can go straight into a TPM role, and we'll talk about some of the signals that might qualify you for that. Um, number two is you could go into a, a different company. You've shared with me that your current company doesn't really have TPMs. You could go into a company that does have TPMs, and then you could use that uh, you could demonstrate the ability and migrate. So I would say one way to get there is as a two-direction a two move. And a different way to get there um, is what you're trying to do, which is directly. And I would say that is normally a little bit harder because any sort of job or role change requires people taking a risk on something that your resume doesn't say you can do versus if they know you and trust you internally and think you're a really good worker, then all they're doing is trusting that you can do a new role. But when I hire you, I'm t already taking the risk of, will you be a good employee? Will you fit the company? Will you fit the culture? And now you're asking me to also take the risk um, and can you do something that you haven't done? And so I see uh, some of our longtime viewers have joined the chat, including a couple people I know are working on uh, role changes of their own. So they'll probably enjoy this discussion of how to move between two jobs, uh, two, two types of work. So um, if I may, I think I have a few comments on your resume that may help with making this move that you're talking about. Um, at least getting you more uh, opportunities. For one thing, and I know you have a cover letter, I would say your resume gets read more than the cover letter because while a recruiter may read the cover letter, oftentimes the hiring manager, that gets stripped off and the hiring manager only sees the resume. And so the key messages need to be in the resume. And one of the current challenges with your resume is there's no objective statement. There's nothing that says, I want to be a TPM. You'd use slightly different words, of course, seeking a role as a technical program manager, you know, uh, objective, apply my tremendous organizational skills to driving programs, something like that. Um, but I think that's the first change I'd recommend. Uh, the second thing um, that sticks out to me uh, is the way your resume is written has a lot of great experience on it, but it doesn't highlight key work experience doing things like a TPM. Um, buried in your resume are some things like creating roadmaps and strategies uh, to set up certain mainframe applications um, that start to sound like you have experience relevant to program management. Um, but, uh, I think if I were trying to do that, I would pull some of those up to the top and say key activities, uh, qualifying me for a program management job or key program management experience. 
And I would list a few of those bullets, even if I had to repeat them under the job so that people could figure out which job they came from. Does that make sense? I'm trying to make it really easy. If I'm the manager trying to figure out, are you a great TPM? As your resume is right now, I'd look at it and I, you know, people joke about how long people do or don't look at resumes, but it's usually very quick. I'd look at it and go, eh, doesn't say TPM has never been one. I'm not sure why the recruiter gave it to me. Of course, the recruiter did it because you're, you applied for that role and because your letter said that's what you want to do. But I'm like, I don't get it. And then I'm on because I have six others to get through. Um, and this is one of the harsh truths. Uh, a lot of times people's motivation as a manager, um, it's difficult and painful to remember your whole life is on this sheet of paper. My goal is I have 50 million things to do. How quickly can I make decisions? And so if you make my decision easy to say yes, oh, I should talk to him more, you go in the yes bucket. And if you make it easy for me to say probably not, you go in the no bucket. And your resume right now for program management is an easy no bucket. And you want to get it to the easy yes bucket. And that probably brings me to my next point. Um, I'm going to take your current job. And I think you have eight or nine bullet points here of great stuff you're doing in your current job. Um, I'll pick on the first three to really bang home a point. Your first bullet begins working on. Your second bullet begins working on. And your third bullet begins part of. Part of an enterprise, etc. Um, and even worse part of an enterprise, blah, 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 committee. None of them speak of accomplishment. They speak of stuff you're doing, but they don't come out as, I did this. Um, and they don't come out as business value. Uh, they don't convey what business value came out of the projects. And as a manager, the rules on a resume, and this is for all resumes, it's not just um, your resume here, it's any resume, um, is action words. You're looking to have strong action words that would uh, give you a sense um, of what you've done and that you owned it. So later on here, you get a little bit closer to that, to be fair, uh, where you start saying created. So I created a custom pipeline for the Salesforce team to perform and build code and quality scans, etc. The only thing missing from that, because you've created something, is what was the business impact. But it's a lot closer because it's an action verb. And so what you're really looking for is created, invented, drove. These are like powerful words. Things like worked on and part of sound like you're a minion taking orders and we should get you a yellow suit with the one eye. And that's not what you want. Sure. Um, so yeah, not a minion, a leader. Uh, so those are my main thoughts. You ask what you should highlight. Highlight the relevant experience, but then try to make the whole resume read about what you've done uh, not and what you've accomplished in the business value, not just what you've been present for. Um, because one of the things that's always a great, a, a tough question is, is this person able to drive, are they able to initiate? And particularly for a program manager, um, you really need to uh, be able to initiate and, and get other people to do stuff. And so what I would try and pull out of some of your history is where have you influenced others? And where have, the other thing is program management is a lot about dates. Where have you worked against a hard date? Even if the story you tell is I'm really good at structuring my own work to hit dates, it's part of the story of I understand being date driven. Um, so that's kind of my resume advice. And I think uh, for everyone here, and, and chat likes the resume advice, uh, thank you, Gunyas, for the uh, uh, feedback. It's about 
coming off as a doer, as a as an action person. So, all right. So your question asks, um, your, one of your questions asks, what about a PMI, uh, PMP, which for those who aren't from this field, um, uh, thank you, uh, PCROD, PCROD C, that could be anybody. Um, but uh, that's what you get in Twitch name handles. But I'm glad uh, people agree. So, um, and welcome into the show. Uh, for those who don't know, PMP is Project Management Professional, I believe. PMI is actually the certifying body. Is that right? Yeah. So I see those letters on resumes. And what PMI tells me um, uh, when I see those is, oh, this person's done some of the work. Like they have, what it tells me, it may tell other hiring managers different things. I can only answer for what I see. But what it tells me is at least this person knows the basics. They speak the language. They've had the training. It doesn't tell me they're a great program manager, but it does tell me they kind of got the tools. And so, for example, you're doing good work uh, getting your AWS Associate Architect certification, which is a great technical certification. If you choose to do um, PMI, the, the PMP, then it tells me that you have checked the box that you at least know the basics. Now, I don't personally put a ton of weight on training because most interviewing, uh, what, somebody asked, sorry, what's TPM? Um, and what a TPM is, it's gonna show up here. Uh, it's getting moderated, but we'll allow that question. Um, what uh, TPM is, is um, a TPM is a technical program manager. So technical program manager, is a variation of program manager. Program managers typically own the schedule and execution, uh, at least keeping track of it and reporting on it, often driving it and planning it, not just for a single project, which would be a project manager, but for a series of projects in a related uh, program. And someone says SCAR is a TPM. Uh, Scar was a guest on the last show. I think Siobhan was watching, so he's familiar with Bobby Scarneman, who brought a bunch of guests. Scar is actually a product manager. What Scar does is help determine what the product should do. TPMs have a voice in that, but yeah, that's okay. It's no problem. Uh, the chat says, my bad. Um, uh, the difference is product managers determine what we should build and program managers determine how and when that's going to get done. And dev managers determine how the heck are we going to get it built and, and scale it. And those are kind of the three pieces of leadership on a tech team. Um, and we have the question, what's the difference between technical program managers versus technical product managers? Great question. Um, program managers drive the execution. If they're technical, they drive the execution of technical projects. We have program managers, for example, who are essentially event planners who plan out our trade shows. So they're not driving technical work, they're driving um, program work for sure and execution of a complex project. Uh, but they're not driving, um, they're not driving uh, technical work. Same thing for a product manager. Uh, a product manager, you can have all kinds of products that are non-technical. Even at a place like Twitch or Amazon, it is possible to have non-technical products. Let's say um, a support product that's like, how do we support developers? Or how do we, if you look at um, Amazon as an example, you can have a uh, product that's about how do we sell and package advertising as a product, but it's not necessarily a technical product. So the technical just adds that you're working basically on software or services. And since Shivang has a deep technical education, that's what he's looking for. So these are really good comments. We'll get back to the PMI thing in just a second. Um, the advice about it, I want to read one of the comments here because it's uh, good. The advice about an objective makes a ton of sense. 
but is interestingly contrary to a lot of what I've read elsewhere. Many internet experts claim it's outdated, but they're probably taking the recruiter's perspective. So um, what I would say about uh, technical product management, um, I, sorry, what I, would, what I would offer on that is maybe it's outdated. Um, I think it's relevant if you know exactly what you're trying to do. And, and more to the point, if you're trying to cross from one role to another, I think being clear about the objective is important because uh, Shivang's resume would lead people to think data engineer, which is something he's done, data integration analyst, or DevOps engineer. And since he's trying to shift, I think he has to call out that shift somehow. Otherwise, the read I would get of is, oh boy, this guy can't find a job and he's spamming every position. He's just throwing his resume at the wall and hoping like, uh, you know, this might work. That isn't, and I, I don't think that's a flattering view. Now, um, thanks for the comment, Akla, uh, one of our longtime subscribers, by the way. I uh, really love to have him here. But um, that's my opinion, is you got to spell out what you want, at least in some degree. However, if you feel like typing a lot in chat, um, I would love to know more why internet experts claim it's outdated and what they say instead. Going back to PMP uh, uh, from PMI, I think it's worth doing. I don't think it will get you the job. I do think it makes it easy for keyword searches and it makes it easy for the interviewer to put you in the give them a call bucket. It's one of those things that moves you to the call. Um, something I say a lot, uh, be little with me. Hello, be little. Um, uh, one of the things I say a lot is the point of a resume is not to get you a job. It's to get you an, a phone screen. The point of the phone screen is to get you an interview. And then the point of the interview is to get you the job. So I've done a lot of the talking. Do you have any questions about what I've said so far or thoughts you want to share? Yep. So I totally agree with the fact that he said uh, most of the recruiters, when they, my resume always, almost always gets picked. But then the calls that I get in turn are for <clears throat> either DevOps engineer or uh, data engineer. So that totally resonates with what you just said. Yeah, they're taking your resume and putting it in the bucket they want. Because to them, it's just a resume, and they're like, well, he's not qualified. They actually may even be trying to do you a favor. Um, they get a resume. And uh, to answer your question, there's a question in chat, what is this? Um, be little with me asked, what is this? We're doing a live stream. I'm the easy coach, and uh, I coach uh, people on how to develop their career. Shivang Zagis tonight asked me some questions about how to move from his current job as a DevOps engineer into being a technical program manager. So I'm answering some of his questions on that. Hopefully, if you're looking at how to improve your career or switch jobs, you can do that. Um, and yeah, uh, thanks uh, 40 Pink Dragons for answering that question right as I did it. Good timing. It's Now it's in writing in the chat. Um, so uh, I think they're probably trying to do you a favor. They're like, well, he's not a TPM. But we have DevOps jobs. We'll give him that. Um, <clears throat> and I will say, uh, we just popped up the link to our question panel. Uh, we're not actually using the question panel tonight, uh, just because it's an informal chat with someone I'm coaching. So tonight, you can go ahead and drop questions into chat. Normally, on our large broadcasts uh, that we do on usually Tuesday nights, we have a an extensions widget lets people ask questions. Um, so uh, my friend wrote back uh, about an objective. So let's see, uh, he quotes uh, one such site that says, in fact, some career experts uh, will tell you that a resume objective is unnecessary at best and dated at worst. Like the line references on request, it's a space filler that's keeping hiring managers from getting to the meat of your resume. You have a limited amount of time in which to grab their attention, eight seconds to be exact, according to one study. Obviously, you don't want to waste any of that time telling them what they already know from the subject line of your email, uh, et cetera. The, the chat comment got cut off. Um, so I, um, <clears throat> I, disagree with, uh, I disagree with that in the case where your experience doesn't match the role. 
that makes perfect sense where as Shivang's experienced, people are going, oh, DevOps engineer, I'll call him about DevOps. In that case, if you wanted to do the same thing, I would agree an objective is a space waster. I think the difference is um, what any reasonable reader would take away from your resume that you want to do, because most people keep doing, they basically want to do what they're doing, only paid more at a better company. Um, in that case, the objective is, is a space waster. I think if you're changing jobs or roles, you have to call it out. Um, yeah. So sweet. Uh, <clears throat> so um, with that in mind, uh, <clears throat> let's see. We were talking about uh, PMP. I don't know what PMP PBA even is, which must mean it's not a common certification. But what is it, Shivan? PBA is pretty new. I guess it was introduced sometime in 2014. It is professional uh, business analyst. Professional business analyst. Yeah, I've never heard of it. Um, my teams don't tend to hire a lot of business analysts, so I won't say it's no good, um, but I will say it's not uh, super, um, uh, it's not something I'm familiar with, um, but it's probably fine. Like, again, if you're trying to establish, like, I know the basics of business analysts and it's a common certification, um, it's like the AWS certification you're getting. Uh, the Cisco Certified Network Analyst, they all say, okay, this person at least has put in the work to better themselves. So I think they're a positive, uh, but they're not they're not going to get you a job usually, at least not, you know, they g- may get you, though, the interview. So did you have, before I move on to your next question, was there anything else you wanted to uh, ask about what I've said or clarify? Yeah, I was just going to ask you about the uh, the PBA versus PMP, which one is preferable, but, but you answered my question. Yeah, if def- definitely if you're looking uh, for program management, the PMP is much stronger. Um, let's see. Okay, sweet. So going to your next question, um, is knowledge of business intelligence, stuff like AWS, QuickSight, Tableau, Microsoft, a plus for a TPM? technical program manager, assuming metrics and report generation are at the heart of a typical technical program manager's job description. Um, Certainly knowledge of BI is an asset, particularly in a job where you may deal with a lot of data. But I would say really good technical program managers, the main report they're generating is a status report. They're telling people um, what's open, Uh, what's blocking, like what the open issues are, what the risks are, what the progress was, what's blocking, what help is needed, like if they're escalating something to management, and maybe action items or dates. And BI doesn't come a ton into that. It's a secondary skill that can help you dig in, but I wouldn't say the main thing a TPM is doing is clearly informing everyone else on the team where we're at where we're going, and who's responsible. I would say the biggest skill of a great TPM is holding other people responsible for stuff. Uh, thank you for the follow, um, goes hose in area codes. Uh, um, thank you for the follow. Uh, anyway, the key thing is they're holding other people responsible without antagonizing them too much. The key social skill is holding people's feet to the fire without alienating them. Um, <clears throat> and we might do that with the fellow in chat. There's somebody who wants to know uh, how ma- about the frogs in the area I'm from. We'll skip that for the moment, but uh, we can hold his feet to the fire later. You can tell us in chat what the frogs are like where you're from. Um, <clears throat> so uh, somebody else wants to know what my first job was and how I moved up the ranks. Uh, I don't want to interrupt you, so we'll answer that later, though. It's a good question. Repeat it towards the end because it's a good story because one of my first roles, though I didn't know to call it that at a time, and I haven't told Shivang that, is I was a TPM. So I went very quickly from SDE to TPM. Um, And plus David says exactly, TPMs are the officials on the field. So sports analogy. I agree with that. They're telling you what the penalty is and how many yards the ball is going to move or who's getting a yellow card and then blowing the whistle. That's a pretty good sports analogy. They're not the coach. They're like explaining where we're at. You could also say in a way they're the color commentator, but that's a little too uninvolved. Um, 
the certification that you haven't mentioned that I think really is valuable is some of the Scrum training. Are you familiar with Agile and Scrum? Yeah. So there's Scrum Master training. And I think if you really want to break into a software uh, type environment as a technical program manager, the best thing I can think of is as a Scrum Master. If I were like going to pick one certification besides PMP, I would pick that. Um, so, all right, uh, your next question was, um, tips and tricks on how to get the recruiter call from top companies. And here, uh, Shivang's used the term FANG. Uh, okay. FANG comes from the stock market. It's sometimes written just F-A-N-G, sometimes it's F-A-A-N-G. It's Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google is what FANG is. And I, it came from FANG stocks because in the last few years, those five stocks drove an outsized growth compared to everything else in the stock market. Um, how to get a recruiter call, TPM in my case, since applying to career websites uh, means competing with hundreds or thousands of candidates, and usually one recruiter is assigned so many positions. Um, so this is a great question. The number one way to get in at any company is with a referral. Um, so trying to know someone and have them put you in. Uh, there's a few reasons for that. Um, most of the companies I've worked with and seen the data, between 25 and 30% of all hires come from referrals. And in some groups, even at Amazon, it's as high as 40%. Of course, some are lower. So the number one way to get attention is have someone refer you. And at least in my group, I tell the recruiters, look, we don't have to hire any referral, but we do need to get back to them. And it may be, by the way, it's not the case with you, but it may be that we look at a candidate and say, this candidate has no place at our company, but we're still going to make a courtesy call to them or at least give them a follow-up email. Not for them, because we've already frankly decided that they're not a fit, but for whoever referred them. Because if you mistreat somebody's refer referral, if you mistreat their friend, uh, they're never coming back to you with another referral. And even though they may have referred somebody who's not a fit right now, and I did once have someone refer their friend who was a dog walker. Um, so a few years ago, yeah, no, I, I had a dog walker referred in that said, well, I know her as my dog walker, but she's an awesome person. And that left me... You know, I got the resume and I'm a little bit like, I just don't know what to do with this. Maybe it's because she didn't have an objective. I don't know. No, seriously, uh, you do get some, uh, we could do a whole show sometime on weird resumes we've seen. Um, maybe that'll be another good topic for the end of the broadcast. Uh, weird, uh, weird resumes we've seen. I definitely have a few stories uh, that I can share there. Um, but I would say, First is an internal referral. And with a company as big as, say, Amazon, uh, you, um, uh, you can probably find somebody you know. Like if you go through your LinkedIn, you can find somebody you know. And that's going to be true for almost any medium-sized company anyway. Um, and you can find someone that can refer you because they don't really need to know you. Just the difference that a resume, like our system tags them as referred by someone, referred by Fred. And so everybody who sees it knows, oh, this person was referred. Um, and that alone is a help. Now, if that doesn't work, I think my next thing I would say is be very specific what you apply to. But I know one of our listeners here, uh, it's really interesting because um, he's been sharing with me his job search and he got nothing, 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 nothing uh, until he was referred into a role. And then that became a full interview at the same company. Um, and so it's a pretty good tip. Um, but if you can't do that, I do think targeting your resume, uh, you know, being willing to rewrite or reheader your resume um, and uh something you fit. I would also say that's the case. Like, let's say you had just exhausted all of your chances of getting a TPM role directly. That's where you pick a company that has a lot of TPM roles. You go back to what your resume says you're good at with DevOps. You take the DevOps role and you migrate. Um, that way, the, that's when you have to do the, I think the two putt. 
Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm trying to help a friend with a very, very narrow resume find a job. He's founded a couple companies. He actually took one public, um, and he was chief scientist at that company. Well, there just aren't very many chief scientist jobs in the world. So trying to help him find his next role as that level of architect or chief scientist, it's very, very hard because it's like, how do you know if a company needs a chief scientist? It's not like a role they post on the website. And so it's extremely difficult. So this can be a hard and frustrating search. For everyone on the chat and listening to this later as a podcast or seeing it on YouTube, I will say, um, if you haven't read the book and you're looking for a new job, uh, What Color Is Your Parachute? It's an excellent book that covers a lot of job hunting advice. I don't know if I recommended that to you before. I don't know. No. So it's a book that was first written by a guy about 30 years ago, and he's been rewriting it every year to keep it current. Uh, but it's got pretty sharp and polished thinking on some of these questions. And so for anybody out there who's not sure how to find a role uh, or wants to make a job change or a city change, I recommend going through What Color Is Your Parachute? It's not a long or hard read, and it's an excellent guide. So we have a few more questions, and then we'll answer the one from KP Hamilton about my career. Um, any other must-have skills for technical program manager and or to get into a FANG company? And FANG basically means any high-performing, high-tech company. They are very competitive, and so the fact that you have a master's degree, I think, is important. Um, it's not that everybody has to have a master's degree, but uh, coming from India, one of the problems you face, which is a type, certainly, of cultural bias, is not everyone... Um, I won't just say not everyone. Most recruiters don't know how to differentiate between the different levels of the many Indian institutions. And so maybe some of them have a sense like, oh, the Indian Institutes of Technology are pretty good. But beyond that, um, they're like, I don't know, it's a name. He went somewhere. And Maybe the world shouldn't be that way, but on my broadcast, we deal in reality, which is what people like about it. And reality is, if you're coming into the U.S. from somewhere else, unfortunately, um, where you went to school, though it may be a top institution where you're from and everyone would know that, people here may not. Um, now, I would, you know, I've, I've done enough. Uh, we, we hire so many people, I'm fairly familiar but um, that won't always be true. So the fact that you then went to a U.S. institution, a well-known one, and got a master's, I think, is a big leg up. But you've done that. So I think that's a big checkbox. Um, and uh, are there any other must-have skills? Um, I don't think there's any other must-have skills. The tricky part you face is your current employer and past employers are all financial so given that if i were seeking a tpm role at amazon or i know you're interested in coming to to seattle so you would look at microsoft at boeing etc i might look for a tpm role in a financial department purely because then you can make the claim when you write your objective to apply my program management skills and deep financial background to product outcomes in a financial group or, you know, in a relevant financial services group. Even if, by the way, you hate financial services and can't wait to get out of them, it's your way in for a year and you go somewhere else. And we've never talked about that. Um, so I'll ask, do you care? Like, you want to be a technical program manager. Do you have a business area that you either do want to be in or don't want to be in? Or is it just any TPM? Well, I don't really care as long as the role is very uh, restricted to or, or caters to the data engineering or DevOps space. Yeah. So you did answer something at the end. I will tell you for sure, never tell a recruiter you don't care and never tell a hiring manager you don't care. I give this advice a lot and I sure want to share it with others. Um, uh, 
the number one and number two things to be successful in any interview once you get to the interview are appearance and enthusiasm. And uh, that's, again, sad, right? It should be like qualifications and maybe intelligence or ability or talent or social skills or EQ. It's not. It's basically, does this person seem like they're excited to work here? And do they, uh, do I resonate with them easily? And what I'll say is people say like appearance. Well, does that mean, you know, you have to be beautiful or something? No, it means don't be the dirty, smelly uh, girl or guy. And don't be the person who interrupts. Don't be someone who puts the other human off. Um, and I don't think you're going to have that problem. But just understand, psychology appears to indicate that most interviewers, um, they interview, uh, they make up their mind in the first 30 seconds of the interview, and they spend the balance of the 45 minutes or hour um, uh, justifying it. So they've already decided on a snap pretty quick, your handshake, how you say hello, maybe the first question. They've already decided based on body language and posture, or they already have an inkling. And the rest of that is them confirming it to themselves so they feel good about themselves when they vote. Because you're going out of the room hoping that person is really thinking about your career and value. They're going out of the room thinking, when I talk to my boss or when we sit in a room in a debrief, am I going to look like I was right? Was I insightful about this person's qualifications? Um, and that's sad. Like, I, I'd like to claim that isn't true, but, but there's just a lot of truth. Yeah, somebody here, uh, Nate Gallagher says, don't smell like weed. <laughs> Even in Seattle, yes, do not come in with blown bloodshot eyes. Uh, that's, that's solid advice, Nate. Um, so there was a question here. Do you think it's a good idea to reach out to hiring managers, senior engineers as an engineer on LinkedIn and ask them to refer us, essentially gaming the referral method? Uh, yes. Let me qualify that. Um, I would try and build a little bit of a relationship with them first. Like I wouldn't reach out to someone you don't know at all and be like, hey, can you refer me? But I would reach out and say like, hey, I've been thinking about joining Amazon and you know, I see we went to the same school or make up some connection, build the rapport. I see you like frogs too, because someone here likes frogs. Um, I see you really like frogs, you're a frog keeper or whatever your commonality that you can identify is. Um, and uh, I was wondering if you could share a little bit about what it's like to work at your company and whatever. Be genuine, be asked something, ask something you care about, but build a relationship a little bit and then hit them up. Okay, you've told me that like it's great. Not only does your company let people bring in their dogs, they can also keep their pet frogs at their desk as long as the aquarium is covered. That I'd really like to work at a place like that. Would you consider referring me? Um, and uh, <laughs> somebody else says they're not a big frog guy. So, um, uh, let's see, uh, don't want to derail your one-on-one coaching, but I'm curious if the average something, a tech firm need both technical and non-technical program, uh, product managers. Uh, my firm doesn't have any actual technical product managers, but I feel like our IT director does it because we don't have any. Uh, it depends on the firm. Like some firms, uh, you know, service firms may have no technical um, product managers, like a bunch of consultants who do financial consulting or lawyers, like a law office is not going to have any technical product managers uh, or program managers. Um, they may have, though, people who work like regular product and program managers. Um, so let's see, uh, because you wrote all your questions down, I'm kind of buzzing through this, answering your questions without hearing too much from you. I'll check in with you again. What else would you like to know? I think we are pretty much spot on. Uh, I spent a lot of time uh, coming up with those questions just so. Uh, okay. We well, you have a couple others here. Um, you ask, is the technical program manager role the best bridge to get to technical product management in the future? 
Coming from tech, I would say absolutely yes. In other words, the most common path I see to product manager from say software engineer or in your case, DevOps engineer is through TPM. Um, and the reason is the TPM role is about half of the product manager role. And specifically, product managers often have to understand schedules. They have to lead through influence because no one reports to them. So they have to get other people to do what they want by convincing them, not by ordering them. And that's a lot of that's the same as the program manager. And so basically the program manager is where you show you have the social skills to be a product manager. And it's also where you learn about product management more because you're often closely partnered. The product manager is saying what to do and you're figuring out when it can be done. And there's a lot of back and forth because often a product manager says, you know, um, our company really needs a time machine and it falls to the program manager to say, well, time machines are hard to build. What problem are you trying to solve? Can you state that as a problem? And it turns out the problem is they want to get the um, end of year billing statements done by January 15th. And they think they need a time machine because it takes 30 days and your job's working them through like, no, no, you know, you just need a faster process. You don't actually need a time machine. Um, now that would be a bad product manager, right? But, uh, and uh, someone here suggests, Gunish uh, suggests it'd be awesome if you can do a how to build influence episode. All right, um, I keep a list of uh, future topics and I'll ask one of my moderators uh, to keep a copy of that uh, later. A couple people like that. So I'd be happy to do a how to build influence session. So we have one more question. Um, uh, that Shivan gave me in advance. I'll answer that. I'll take any more of his questions. If anybody in chat, because we have a nice active chat tonight, if any of them, if any of you have questions for either him or I about this topic, you can drop them in the chat. And I haven't forgotten the one about what was my first job. So I will get to that. Um, and uh, that full question was, what was your first job and how did you move up in the ranks? That'll be a fun story. Um, and the uh, moderators already recorded that for me in my archive. So I have good mods. Thank you for modding. Um, so follow up to the question of getting the technical program manager, what other skills without an MBA, in addition to the ones uh, that a TPM have, would be breakthrough? Well, it's interesting you put without an MBA because, of course, the number one answer is an MBA. But plenty of people become great product managers without an MBA. Um, I can't answer for every, um, for every company, probably different companies have. And if there's people here who are product managers from elsewhere, they can certainly weigh in. I think the biggest thing, the BI skills you have are going to be super valuable because knowing SQL and being able to pull your own data, product managers are often doing research. And so being able to process through a lot of data and being able to make sense of it and make tables and charts that convey, because what does a product manager usually ask? Well, you say we need to build this, why? How much will it increase our revenue? How much will it build our business? So being really good at, uh, an M, uh, at, at data analysis is huge actually. So you'll actually have an easier time going on to being a product manager from, from program manager than many. The other skill though is financial. So even if you only take one college class, like a basics of a accounting or finance so that you can create a good business model, that's really what it's about. The ability to create a business model or a business plan and say, okay, um, uh, I wanna propose that we should build you know, um, people are working on flexible telephones, phones that can be folded, um, the, the screen is flexible. Well, what's the business case for that? What are the use cases for a foldable screen? How often would they get used, et cetera? So I think, and then how much is that worth? What's the cost? What's the benefit? That's the kind of question a product manager is often asked in a proposal. Um, I also think, uh, you know, and I have your cover letter here Product managers do a lot of writing. And so um, 
uh, I think being a pretty good writer matters because you're trying to convince people. And so to the question of influence, uh, I think being influential involves a lot of writing. So that's the end of your written questions. And that was fantastic. I do feel like it's, uh, I'll have to keep in mind for future sessions, it's made you sort of a listener. Um, so with that in mind, are there any other questions you have that, um, I have a couple in chat here, but is there anything else you'd like to know? Because it's your show in a way tonight. I just, I can just think of one of them. So uh, like I already shared with you that I have performed uh, project management and to some extent program management responsibilities as well in my former roles. Uh, of course, part-time, but not full-time. So is the road to a technical program manager going to be as deep as someone who doesn't have, uh, who has zilch uh, program management experience just because I don't, I, I haven't held an official title? Uh, no, clearly it's not as deep. In fact, I would argue that people who've never done what you've done though, won't ever get those jobs. So I would, I would argue that they're never going to get, uh, never is a long time, but it's going to be very hard for them to get a TPM job if they haven't shown some ability either inside a company or outside a company to do that work. They're going to have to get very lucky. Um, you know, and that's, that's key. Let's ask, why have you done that work? What led you to do it when, um. you, when you did do that work? I mean, initially when I started, I never knew that I would I would enjoy the responsibility of, of leading and uh, being held responsible for, let's say I was dealing with a lot of regulatory related stuff. And I understood the regulations in and out and all I had, all I mean, the business wasn't involved at all. I would understand the regulations. I would just go and work with legal, create a solution and have the business test it out. And based on their their uh, uh, testing, they would, they would suggest certain uh, upgrades or whatever, but that's pretty much it. I never had to go to business and ask them for the requirements because I clearly think I understood more than, and that that goes from the feedback that I got from them as well, that we clearly understand the technology partner understands, uh, the regulations more than we do. So they had that kind of trust in me and my, uh, team of two or two or three developers that I was working with. Great. That's fantastic. And that's the kind of experience you want to find a way to bring forward. You want to actually say, acted as program manager for team of three developers to deliver regulatory solutions for fill in the blank. That sounds like a TPM, right? That's, that's your nugget. But the reason I, I ask you a loaded question, um, which is why did you do this work? There's usually only two answers. Number one, people find they have to do it it's not being done and they're suffering without it. So they get into it, not because they're interested, but because it's someone's got to do this. The other reason is they find they enjoy it. Um, and so I'll segue a little bit into my early career. I found out that I enjoyed um, solving human puzzles as much or more as technical puzzles. I was an engineer, a developer, um, used to writing a ton of code. And I found that I got into a company and there was all this broken shit that was people not organized and it drove me crazy. And so I got into being effectively a TPM, though our company didn't have that title, uh, in order to organize what was broken. And so I'm, I'm, uh, I am a little bit of very, uh, methodical, super methodical person and um, uh, seeing stuff out of order really bothered me. Um, I don't want to say too much uh, over reveal about my personal life yet, but I, I definitely am a person whose car keys go in the same place every night and whose wallet goes in the same spot on my bedside table every night. And um, as a result, I was kind of wired for that. And when I got into a business environment where it wasn't that way, I had to go do something. And so that was a little bit like you, I was drawn to the work. Um, so we got a question here. Um, do you think differently of an online MBA versus MBA while working versus taking time off to do an MBA? So uh, chat would like to know different types of MBAs. 
Um, I've shared this before on other broadcasts. I want to clearly label that I'm biased here because late in my time at my first job, I applied to an executive MBA program because I was, I had become a TPM and I was thinking, oh, I'm going to go into management or whatever. Maybe I should get an MBA. And obviously you've considered an MBA because you say no to it, right? Yep. Yeah. So you've thought about it and decided not to. Tell, tell me before I finish why I didn't do it. Why did you not do it? I just didn't uh, want to throw away all my years of technical uh, knowledge that I had built over the years. And uh, I, I thought that it is still possible to uh, progress in management with technical skills. And I don't have to necessarily bank on an MBA to get to where I really want to. Uh, so that's interesting. Uh, I agree with you. You can advance without one because I did and many other people have. And I'll talk about that in a second. But you use really strong words, throw away your technical background. Uh, how, why do you see it that way? Well, if, uh, if I wanted to, so basically MBA would probably be in finance. Mm. So if I totally get into finance, that means I'm just focusing on finance related stuff and then all my technical years of technical and engineering degree that just disappears. Well, so that's interesting because you could do an MBA without being in finance. It's a choice. Um, and our most valuable, when we do hire program manager, uh, sorry, product managers, our favorite type of product manager is someone with an engineering degree and an MBA because we feel that they truly understand technology and they can build, but they truly understand business and they can determine requirements and figure out business opportunities. Now that doesn't mean you need an MBA, but if we have a single model of like product manager, it's definitely that. Um, so uh, going back to the question though of online MBA, truly online MBAs, uh, look all online schools, online degrees have a little bit of taint. Did you cheat? Did, like. They all have the they all have the implication that it was University of Phoenix. No matter where you actually went, what people think is, oh, it's University of Phoenix. Like I don't know about that, and that's a bias. It's just like me telling Shivang honestly that unfortunately a lot of people aren't going to know about his undergraduate college. It's a bias that online degrees have a taint, but they do, and there's no point in lying about that. Um, doesn't mean, by the way, that you can't learn good skills in an online MBA. Uh, and that you can't put those skills to good use to generate results, but it's going to be more work than if you're able to tag on one of the big massive MBA programs, whether it's a state program like, say, Kellogg, which I think is Michigan, or, you know, if it's the Harvard MBA, which is like the gold standard, um, or the Stanford MBA. Um, the problem with MBAs is tons and tons of money. Uh, you've got to really get a lot out of it or the time and money you sink into it is killing you. So um, the MBA while you work is an impressive accomplishment simply because what it tells me about you is like, wow, this person really wanted an MBA and they busted their ass. And to be very fair, that's where I backed off. Um, in my first job, uh, my first employer anyway, I went and applied and got into a pretty good MBA program and it was an executive MBA. So it was like uh, all day Friday, every other week. And on the week that it wasn't on Friday, it was all day Saturday in my case. And they told me um, our coursework is going to be 30 hours of work a week. And I was already working a lot more than 40 hours. And I personally took a look at my life and I said, OK, what do I have to cut out? I tried to make a list. What do I have to cut out to come up with 30 hours? And it turned out to be a bunch of stuff I wasn't willing to cut. Um, and so that's why I personally didn't do an MBA um, because it is a huge, it's a huge effort. And I certainly have friends, some of them uh, are on the chat sometimes, I don't see them here tonight, who've done an MBA while working and it's, it's very draining. So, um, <clears throat> Shivang, I'll ask you to hang out for a second. I want to answer that question. You may find it interesting about why I became uh, early in my career. So my first job was uh, at a high-speed networking company. 
and I was hired as an SDE, um, and I was brought on to a project that turned out to be hopelessly behind. And my job essentially was the product was being built by a partner, um, what we would now call an OEM, an original equipment manufacturer. And my job was kind of to add a little software to it and help test it and write the